Hello and welcome to topic 6, part 2 on polymer permeability. In this part of the lecture we're going to discuss two different scenarios where a gas would want to diffuse through a polymer membrane. The first scenario involves a homogeneous polymer film where the entire thickness of the polymer membrane is one continuous material. The second scenario involves a multi-layered polymer films which as we'll see is actually quite common. Let's begin with the simpler case of a homogeneous film. In this situation we assume that we have constant pressure P1 on the inside of the polymer membrane and constant pressure P2 on the outside of the polymer membrane. This sets up a diffusion gradient across the polymer membrane that is linear. Whenever we have a linear gradient across the thickness of the polymer membrane like this we assume fixed first law. Fixed first law says that the flux or the mass per unit time per unit area traveling through the material is equal to minus D, the diffusion coefficient, times the concentration gradient or the change in concentration with respect to the distance traveled. Now it turns out that for polymer permeability we can rewrite this equation as negative P, capital P, the permeability of the polymer which is related to the diffusion coefficient times the pressure gradient dP dx. If I convert the pressure gradient into actual values, we get negative P, the permeability, times the difference in the pr internal pressure minus the outside pressure, divided by zero minus the thickness of the polymer. The negative signs cancel, and we get P times P1 minus P2 over L, and that's equal to the mass flow rate divided by the area. So I can solve for the mass flow rate, or the number of moles per second that travels through the polymer membrane, and that's equal to the permeability times the area of the membrane times the pressure differential across the membrane divided by the thickness of the membrane itself. A pretty straightforward equation, I think. Keep in mind that the diffusion flux, d dc dx, is equal to the, per the permeability times the pressure gradient. It can be rewritten as the permeability being equal to d times the diff the concentration gradient times the inverse of the pressure gradient. And remember that C over P is equal to the absorption S. That means the permeability of the polymer is equal to the diffusion coefficient of the polymer times absorption S. So let's take a look now at a multi-layered thin film polymer. In this case, such as in the case of soda bottles, you have polyethylene terephthalate that's coated on the inside with silica glass or PVDC, polyvinyl dichloride, to reduce the CO2 permeability through the, mem the membrane. In this case, total permeability is given by the, perme the length or thickness of the total multilayered film times the permeability of the first layer divided by the thickness of the first layer plus the permeability of the second layer divided by the thickness of the second layer and so on out to the nth permeability divided by the nth thickness of the polymer. Once again we see that we have an inside pressure and an outside pressure or final pressure and that there's a concentration gradient across each layer of the multi-layer film and this concentration gradient changes as a function of which section of the film we're in because of the different permeabilities across each of the different layers of polymer. Keep in mind also that the total length L is equal to the sum of the individual lengths of each multilayer film. We can now calculate something called the resistance or the diffusion resistance of each layer of polymer film, R sub I. And that's simply equal to the length of each polymer film divided by the permeability of that film. In other words, a thicker section of polymer will have higher resistance simply because it takes more time for a molecule to diffuse across that longer thickness. In addition, if I have a low permeability polymer, a polymer that resists the permeability of a, of a molecule through its thickness, I'll tend to have a higher resistance, which also makes sense intuitively. I can now calculate the mass flow rate as being equal to the area times the pressure difference between the inside and outside of the polymer membrane divided by the summation of the resistances of each layer of the membrane. So let's take an example of a PET soda bottle. PET soda bottles are filled with both soda, of course, and also CO2 for carbonation. 
The question is, how many grams of CO2 will be lost from the soda bottle in four weeks' time? We can begin by assuming that we have a homogeneous PET polymer membrane film. So we use our homogeneous film equation to solve for the mass flow rate per unit time. We put in some numbers for the approximate radius of a polymer uh, soda bottle, 0.05 millimeters, and 0.3 meters height to calculate the surface area of this general cylinder. We'll treat our polymer soda bottle as a cylinder for the simpl simplification of this problem. And we get an area of 0.096 meters squared. We then have to input the permeability of PET, which is about 30 times 10 to the negative 18th meter squared pascal seconds per mole. The wall thickness of the bottle is approximately 1 millimeters, and the inside pressure is about 0.31 megapascals, with an outside pressure of 0.103 megapascals. Plugging these numbers in for the mass flow rate, we arrive at a mass flow rate of 1.19 times 10 to the minus 9th moles per second. If I convert this into number of moles by multiplying the mass flow rate by four weeks, we arrive at 0.0017 moles, and using the molecular mass of CO2, we arrive at 0.76 grams of CO2. Now that may not seem like very much, but keep in mind that CO2 is a very lightweight molecule, so this is a significant amount of CO2 being lost from the soda bottle. Now let's imagine we coated the inside and outside of the PET soda bottle with 4 microns of PVDC to enhance the barrier properties of the film. In this case, we have to use the non-homogeneous or multi-layer film equation for mass flow rate, where I have the area of the soda bottle, as calculated previously, times the pressure difference across the multi-layer film of the soda bottle wall, divided by the resistance of the PET plus 2 times the resistance of the PVDC. And it's two times the resistance because we have two layers of PVDC, one on the inside of the bottle and one on the outside. I can calculate the resistance of the PET bottle by taking the thickness of the PET, or 0.5 meter to, uh, millimeters, and dividing it by the permeability of PET to get the resistance of 1.67 times 10 to the 13th meter squared pascal seconds per mole. The resistance of the PVDC is calculated in a similar fashion, assuming in this case we have 4 microns of PVDC and uh, a permeability of PVDC of 7 times 10 to the negative 18th moles per meter pascal second. So I arrive at 5.71 times 10 to the 11th meter squared pascal seconds per mole for the resistance of PVDC. Now plugging these numbers into our equation above, we arrive at a total mass flow rate of 1.11 times 10 to the minus 9th moles per second. And again, I can convert that into grams of CO2 by multiplying the mass flow rate by four weeks, and I get 0.71 grams of CO2. So this is a reduction in the amount of CO2 lost, but you notice it's not a very large reduction. Only about 0.05 grams of CO2 have been prevented from permeating across the membrane. And this could be for a number of reasons. Number one, PVDC has a permeability of about one-fourth that of polyethylene terephthalate, but it's not quite low enough in order to prevent CO2 from permeating through the, the walls of the soda bottle. In addition to that, our thickness of the PVDC layer is only four microns thick. We'd want to use a much thicker film of PVDC if we wanted to prevent more CO2 from passing through. Another solution to this problem would be to use soda glass instead of PVDC, which has a significantly lower permeability than PVDC. Our assumption behind the last example was that we had a linear pressure gradient across the PET and PVDC films. But when the bottle is first pressurized, the gradient will be nonlinear because you have a non-steady state diffusion condition. In other words, you'll have very high concentrations of CO2 at the internal wall and very low concentrations of CO2 and a nonlinear on the outside of the wall and a nonlinear concentration gradient between the two. For this situation, we need to apply a fixed second law. Fixed second law says that the partial derivative of the concentration with respect to time is equal to the diffusion coefficient times the second order differential of the concentration gradient. Now, I'm not going to solve this equation here. It requires some ordinary partial differential equation solutions. But suffice to say that the distance that a molecule will travel into the polymer is a function of the square root of the diffusion coefficient times time. Now remember that the permeability is equal to the diffusion times absorption, as was seen in a previous slide. That means that we can rewrite the um, equation for diffusion of the, the molecule 
as being equal to a function of the square root of the permeability divided by the absorption times time. If we solve this basic equation, we determine what is called the lag time for a gas to reach the other side of a film of thickness L. Again, assuming we have a homogeneous film. In this case, the lag time T sub L is equal to the length squared divided by six times the ratio of the permeability to the absorption. So if we have a very high absorption, we tend to have a large lag time for the molecules to reach the other side of the film. In addition, we can greatly increase the lag time by changing the thickness of the film. And we can also increase the lag time by decreasing the permeability of the film. It turns out the permeability of substances through polymers is important in many applications. We've already talked about twos, PET soda bottles, and packaging for food and drugs. Another example would be permeability of gasoline through the high-density polyethylene walls of a fuel tank. California mandates by law that only one half gram of gasoline can escape from a fuel tank uh, every 24 hours. To accomplish this, engineers have designed fuel tanks to be about seven millimeters thick, or roughly a quarter inch, and consist of multiple layers of virgin polyethylene, reground polyethylene, and ethylene vinyl alcohol, or EVA, to act as a barrier layer. This is a multi-layer film, and we could calculate the permeability of gasoline vapors, or I should say the mass flow rate of gasoline vapors based on their permeability through this multi-layer film. Another example is that of dialysis. In blood dialysis, the idea is to pass blood through a membrane and get the, the urea, which is of course a byproduct of food processing in your body, to diffuse out through the membrane and prevent the blood from passing through the membrane. This requires the permeability of urea molecules through a polymer. And the way this is done is the blood, the urea-rich blood, is passed through very small fibers of polysulfone. The urea has a high permeability through the polysulfone. So as, was, as seen in this picture, on the left we have urea-rich blood traveling towards the right. The urea diffuses through the polysulfone into a glucose-rich solution. The glucose, however, does not have the ability to permeate into the blood. And in fact, excess glucose actually in the blood actually permeates into the, sol to the glucose solution. So urea is trapped in the glucose solution, which is traveling in the opposite direction of the blood. And this way we filter out the urea from the blood.